broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. The Australian government and the new national cabinet, they made the decision very early on when the coronavirus pandemic, it was clear it had arrived here, that saving lives was their paramount goal with the means to achieving that goal being to flatten the curve of daily infections, which uh, we are achieving at the moment. The the curve has not just flattened, it is now uh, dipping, which is very good news. However, to achieve this flattening of the curve and to, uh, to, to make sure the, the death, uh, death toll uh, didn't substantially uh, rapidly increase like it has in the United States uh, today. This meant shutting down all non-essential businesses and issuing a state home order. So that's being enforced at the state level. We cannot leave our homes unless we are traveling for essential supplies, medical care, exercise, work, or for education. This has seen hundreds of thousands of Australians and millions around the the Western world uh, lose their jobs and have their businesses destroyed. Governments are ramping up the debt and uh, the money printing presses are going overtime to, to pay for the new welfare needed to compensate those who've lost their jobs and businesses during the pandemic. The angst, stress and uncertainty plus the indignity of having your livelihood cut off and being confined to your home uh, it's going to have a severe impact on the, the mental health of millions of australians so how can this be managed is the disease worse is the cure worse than the disease is what a lot of people have been asking tonight i'll be playing my recent recorded interview with dr tanvir ahmed who is a psychiatrist based in inner west sydney he has been a commentator in the australian media on both uh, mental health and politics for over a decade he has previously written for the australian newspaper you can now read his cu- current columns in the australian financial review he is the author of uh, two books uh, the exotic Rissol, published in 2011 and fragile nation in 2017 i interviewed tanvir about uh, his fragile nation uh, book which was published by Connor Court publishing at the the melbourne launch it was one of the the early unshackled waves episode he's also appeared uh, countless times on television and radio currently he's a regular panelist on the sky news opinion program in my view which airs at 8 p.m sydney time every sunday night so without further ado let's get into tonight's uh, featured interview this is wilms front brought to you by the unshackled.net Tanvir, good to see you again. Pleasure to be with you, Tim. Thanks for having me. Uh, I know that uh, we previously saw each other in person, but uh, in in this age of social isolation, uh, when you say to someone, good to see you, you can only see them through a a, a camera on the, the virtual world. Yeah, it's nice to see you digitally. You know, it's, we're all getting more used to that and we'll probably get more and more skilled at that, I think. Uh, obviously, uh, my audience is uh, familiar that uh, I'm broadcasting uh, from my, my new uh, home studio. And obviously, we, with your work as a, a psychiatrist, it's it's normally done uh, face-to-face in a, a consulting room. Uh, you've also travelled around the, the cities and the, the, the regions to, to meet different uh, clientele. So how's your own uh, work changed uh, with the... Uh, containment measures and uh, social distancing and isolation measures? Look, unlike most of other medicine, I mean, I guess the psychiatrists in some ways have one advantage that we don't necessarily need to do physical procedures by and large. So digital, more than most aspects of medicine, digital should work better. better. And in many ways, the government's been trying to get us to do more digital work, especially regionally. I mean, One of the most difficult things about servicing Australia is, you know, we're so spread out and so um, uh, not densely populated. So for a range of reasons, it makes servicing in a whole range of areas quite difficult. So the government's wanted us to go more digital for for years and had various incentives to do so. So on that front, coronavirus has escalated that, you know, probably what's taken more than a decade for government, coronavirus has done it in about two, three weeks. So suddenly people are shifting 
quite dramatically to Skype, FaceTime, you know, webcam, what it, whatever it is. Uh, and it, I think it is more a little bit more challenging, but you know, I think it's good enough. You it, you you don't get the subtleties necessarily. I think you can still form strong human connections, you know, digitally. Um, and I think you probably get more skilled at doing it. Um, but look, overall, uh, I guess in, in some ways my practice has suffered much less than many of my colleagues. So, for example, a lot of surgeons and other doctors, they've had elective procedures shut down. Um, so like a lot of other sections of the economy, even many doctors, so you would think healthcare has is a major victor of the current circumstances from a industry or economic point of view, that that's not necessarily the case. There's a there are there are differences between say the private and public sector in particular. But psychiatry certainly hasn't suffered, but um, we've had to go more digitally. And I've certainly had a few colleagues that have are uh, probably more frightened. Not that I'm frightened. I'm probably more cautious than uh, especially frightened. But I've certainly had colleagues who who are really, you know, almost immediately, probably two weeks ago, well, you know, took their files home and said, like, I'm not seeing a single person um, face to face. So the reality is doctors are at greater risk, you know, right across the world, something like three to four times higher risk uh, healthcare workers. You know, many doctors have died in Italy and Spain in particular, uh, as well as um, in the UK and to some extent now. So that risk is there, but fortunately for psychiatrists, it's probably slightly less. Yeah, we've seen here in Australia uh, healthcare workers that uh, I think it's the, the the Prince Alfred in Melbourne uh, contract coronavirus, and over in the, the UK there's been NHS H workers who've uh, contracted it. So that is a, a challenge in itself because hospitals are they can be incubators uh, themselves. But uh, you raised uh, two points there about the uh, containment measures, that there is uh, room for, for innovation. And thankfully, our national broadband network has, has held up uh, for the moment. There, there doesn't seem to be as many as much web frustration as many of us uh, feared, but there's also that uh, disruption uh, as well. And obviously a lot of, including uh, health professionals are being redistributed and we've sort of seen that in more of the, the general economy where, for example, Qantas and Village Roadshow are trying to get their workforce redistributed to to, to Woolworths, which is, which is good, but it's the disruption there. And there's also a lot of, uh, industries where it's if you're running a business then uh, it's a completely uh, different you can't really redistribute uh, your business in a in a short uh, space of time and obviously the purpose of these coronavirus containment measures or lockdown as we're sort of starting to call it now is to save lives and uh, stop our health system and workers being uh, overwhelmed. But with uh, this massive disruption, some are able to be redistributed, some uh, can't be. Uh, many have considered, is the cure worse than the disease? Because business and economic shutdowns in the past have proven to cause uh, mental health issues and family and relationship uh, breakdowns. And... Uh, being confined to your your home, uh, not having a means to uh, dignified uh, work. Where do you stand on this? I'm not sure I've come to a clear decision as yet. In some ways, I, I, perhaps I've become a bit more compliant uh, over the years. I mean, I, I, in general, I'm trusting the government who have the kind of exceptional data on this in terms of trying to balance the, the public health requirements with the economic ones. I mean, so over the years, I've been a critic of some public health philosophy where, you know, in many respects, there's an overreach. Uh, you know, for example, say in Sydney, where you had the big lockdown, uh, you know, there's often these calls to ban this or that, you know, ban sugar, etc. So in some ways, a lot of public health ideas in recent decades have overlapped with a lot, a lot of luxury ideas we've had more generally with sort of great prosperity. And potentially now what we're seeing what, you know, what public health is really about. I mean, this is what public health came about. Um, the history of medicine is primarily the history of infection. Uh, and it's only probably in the last half a century 
where it's been something other than that. Um, so we forget the central place of infectious disease and its control uh, through not just the history of medicine, but the history of civilization. So what we're seeing now has been with us for a long time. We've just forgotten about it, um, given our prosperity and our mastery in some respects of, the, of our environment and the world around us. In terms of the economic shock, I mean, it's, it's enormous, isn't it? I mean, I guess arguably the way I interpret it is this. We've, we essentially live in such a prosperous society that we can essentially value human life um, it, it, to such an extent that we can, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for this uh, by and large, that we can, uh, we can eff effectively decide that we're going to save 100,000 people at the risk, at the you know, at a significant cost economically. Now, you are right in the longer term, which is much tougher to predict, that that will also have its costs, you know, be it in uh, potentially mental health costs, potentially suicide, potentially other health problems. Uh, that is a possibility. And, um, uh, I mean, the hope is that we can get on top of this uh, sooner rather than later. But... In the short term, I think there was a genuine risk. So I think public health and doctors more generally often calculate the, cat the immediate catastrophic health risk at the expense of all else. And we see this in a whole range of policy areas. And I think in general, doctors are not so well equip equipped to see other trade-offs, the social and economic trade-offs versus the health ones. But I think in this case, when you see some of the worst modelling and uh, realistically, I don't think any Western society can tolerate, you know, hundreds of thousands of deaths. Uh, and, and really, that was what the modelling was showing. I think it'll be become much clearer, possibly in, in upcoming weeks, actually, sooner, sooner rather than later. In the next few weeks, we'll get a much clearer sense, as we're getting more and more testing, we'll get a much clearer sense of what actually is the, the prevalence of of the of, of coronavirus in the community and what is the actual mortality is it you know 0 0.5 percent is it closer to two percent and if it's closer to 0 0.5 percent then i think there will be grounds to relax some of these measures so really a lot of this is what more might look like overreach i think is in part a reaction to not having all the data and and the risk that you would have a catastrophic and a very quick one, a very quick one. If you had a bit of time with this, sure, you could you could potentially, you had some leeway, but, you know, and, and the reality is we can all see what's happened in places like Italy and Spain, and it, that's really not something any government's going to take. It, it, they're going to err on the side of overreach, um, you know, to avoid that kind of catastrophe, I think. So, in the, look, in the short term, I, I am actually agreeable to the government uh, reactions. I think some of it is a bit over the top and not entirely based on evidence. You know, only two people walking around or, you know, you can't sit in a park or I think some of it, I'm not sure there's any basis for it. And it just, it just sounds a bit totalitarian and a bit over the top, uh, especially in a place where, you know, we're not Italy and Spain. We've, we've had less than 25 deaths. Um, yes, we have to protect the future and then getting, not getting worse, but uh, I think some of it is not terribly justifiable and I'm not sure how we, uh, not that it's happened, but I, I can't see how we can justify, say, a further lockdown, for example. Uh, you're right that we've seen uh, a lot of uh, compliance uh, with the, the, the shutdown uh, measures and the, the business uh, cl closures, uh, but uh, there has, uh, I share your concerns this week that there, that it, there does seem to uh, be uh, more of a, a draconian uh, step, especially with the uh, the police in your home state of, of New South Wales driving onto the parks and that people who uh, are practicing social distancing, uh, they're, they're reading by themselves or just sunbaking, getting a bit of vitamin D because that is also a healthy uh, as well, and obviously the the police they want to look like they're uh, enforcing the uh, these containment uh, measures, and obviously when you say trust the government, obviously I'm 
I, I don't like uh, that as a as a general rule, uh, but we we have seen with uh, with the sort of concern expressed this week that our government through its national cabinet is uh, they've said they're going to try and get the, the the balance right, and uh, they have they they basically implemented these measures at the exact right time because they didn't want to go with the the, the hard lockdown but they don't want to end end up like spain or italy and new york it looks like it'll go down the the spain italy path it's on a terrible uh trajectory i think that's true i mean i guess that's these these are places that are trying to catch up uh so that's where i think we are slightly ahead of the curve because we impl implemented fairly strong measures beforehand we place like italy and spain you know they're having huge soccer games parties you know the flights from china were coming consistently so they're playing catch up and i think that's why they've had to have a extra overreach whereas you know a significant proportion of our cases have come from overseas you know not least cruise ships so that's where some of our failures have have happened i mean look on something such as sort of world historical as this sort of thing you know the, the reality is none of us none of us know because we, we don't actually have all the information. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so the, 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 there is the prospect we are overreaching. However, if we are overreaching and we can, at, but it, that's a temporary one, um, then I think you know, a country like Australia can get back on its footing pretty fast. But if we were, the, the problem is if we didn't, you know, the alternative is really quite, uh, you know, really quite frightening, uh, you know, potentially having... You know, Australia's never seen anything like that. We imagine having, you know, tens of thousands. And we do have our advantages. You know, our low, the low, the lower density of our population, for example, you know, that's one. So I think it's a, just our relative isolation and the fact we can pretty much, you know, bring down the hatches. So I think we may well have some unique advantages that may allow us to reduce the restrictions. That's my hope anyway. So I, as we learn more, we'll get a better sense of, okay, uh, what are the advantages we have and how how can we parlay that? And obviously some countries like Sweden, for example, are, you know, taking quite different measures. And again, it'll become clearer in the coming weeks uh, how successful that is. And, and the reality is if they are, have been quite successful, um, you know, that'll be quite a model, I think, where, you know, to, to a large extent you can let things go on. I mean, the, the, real, the real thing is if you can immediately test people positive, quarantine them, you know who they are, if you have that capacity, then you've got much more control over this. And I think that testing capacity is starting to come up um, and you're getting new technologies too. So there's enormous energy being devoted to this. So as soon as you can be get a quick result and you know very quickly as a as a as a as a, uh, a, a administrate as an administration where the people infected are, where they need to be quarantined, how you limit their contacts then you, you, you've got a much stronger, once you, once you can see the enemy, you, you, you've, you've got a much better chance then of, you know, allowing everything in and around the enemy to, to function. Uh, at this stage, we're, we're not quite on top of that central um, concept, though, being able to see the enemy. And that's why we're having to really batten down the hatches. Yeah, because it's a, a virus, not a, a human being. Uh, even the the medical professionals, the the virologists, uh, they they still don't know everything uh, about it, and that's why a lot of the any sort of predictions, including uh, media commentators such as myself, uh, make uh, it, it's almost uh, folly uh, at the moment. But uh, you're right that Australia, our, our tyranny of distance, as historian Geoffrey Blaney said, is our greatest strength here. And we we are uh, getting uh, ahead with the, the, the testing, rolling out the, the, the testing, which is is, is one of the, the, the best ways where we can identify who has the, the virus and better quarantine rather than have a a mass uh, lockdown, but it was two uh, weeks ago when the, the National Cabinet uh, made their decision to, to close cafes, bars, restaurants, pubs, where uh, people congregate in, in large numbers and there was evidence on that 
uh, previous weekend, they weren't practicing social uh, distancing. And so on the Monday morning, we uh, we saw those large lines outside of uh, Centrelink uh, offices, our, 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 the federal government's welfare headquarters, and obviously the sudden and unexpected shock of being in that line, not due to your own uh, mistakes, uh, because the government has shut down uh, your industry. It's not that it's not that you're uh, you got you got stood down uh, because you did a bad job or because uh, your business model was bad, uh, but just because these measures are necessary during the the, the pandemic. And there's also being in that uh, jobless queue. There's the removal of of dignity. And I know that uh, there are uh, there there is this sort of uh, expression where all oh, the, the the government's got this grant or handout. I should see if uh, I, I can apply to get it. But there's a lot of people who don't want to put their their hand out to to government uh, uh, for a payment. They they want to be self self sufficient. So there is that uh, that uh, stripping of your independence. Oh, of course. I mean, that's one of the most horrific things about this. You know, it's people who had, you know, had probably, you know, have never got close to a, uh, a Centrelink office and suddenly having to line up. And I think that's one of the areas the government could have done better, actually, because there's no reason. I think other parts of the world where they were able to get money straight into people's bank accounts. And, and really, the government has the ability to potentially do that. Um, so some of those things where you've got all these people waiting hours in front of a Centrelink, yeah, there is, I think there's a real... Um, blow to human dignity that was unnecessary you know there's enough distress as it is so trying to minimize that at, at every corner you know should be considered uh, now look it's horrible i'm seeing people like that you're not only you know, you've got people whose retirement savings have been, have been slashed you've got people overnight lost their businesses and their jobs i mean it's it's horrible i mean in our lifetimes we haven't seen anything like this uh, i mean i'm lucky you know it really doesn't uh, certainly it doesn't affect my income or work so in that respect you know, I'm extremely lucky, one of the lucky few, uh, and it's horrible to see this uh, around us happen. Uh, and I hope, you know, we get out of it faster. I think Australia is better placed, and you are right. This is one of the places we often complain about, you know, being isolated or being a kind of a cultural backwater, all these things. I mean, this is one area, this is one time when, you know, I think it's our isolation and our distance, both Australia and New Zealand, we can really shut the gates and, and you know, I hope... That will be a big advantage in um, in what's happening. I mean, from the economic side, again, it's so early in this. You know, there'll be all, ma all manner of people with all manner of stuff to say. And you are right; there is the prospect that the cure, you know, may be you know pretty brutal uh, with significant side effects. And it is hard. I mean, the reality is the measure, and some people have written about this, and it's always a tough one to argue. The unit of measure that you're trying to save is, you know, and, you know, some economists have argued this, public health officials too, is life years adjusted. So which me which measures, not that not single lives, but life years, um, and the reality is it brings up things about, you know, are old people's lives, you know, worth less than young people's lives because taking a lot of jobs and you can actually calculate and give estimates that, you know, say uh, someone in their 30s and 40s with bad job and their risk of having various diseases thereafter, not, you know, being unemployed, that may well reduce life years in the very longer term. Uh, I mean, we can't predict it with certainty, but you can certainly, you can model some of these things. So that's a very challenging debate to have. And because really what we're doing at the moment, yeah, that's the, you know, that's the trade-off we're making all the time. Because whenever we ease restrictions, there's a prospect that that will lead to more more lives lost but whenever you increase them there's also all this if not what called mortality so much more morbidity, morbidity morbidity not even saying it properly and that's the notion of um illness and loss of function without actual death so it's where you're ill you can't do all these things but you're not necessarily dead so it's like we're choosing a lot of that over the actual death part but the longer term impacts of that, you know, may well be um, equal or, or if not worse. Uh, and again, the reality is we just don't know. It's still quite early. We will know probably fairly soon. Within, you know, within weeks we'll get a, a quick sense. But, I mean, these are, you know, these are, these are huge decisions our governments are making and 
I think a lot of it is just that scare you get when when you're seeing the absolute misery that's in Italy and Spain. I think when governments see that, they're like, we we cannot even remotely risk that. I mean, you've got economies like the United States on you know on its knees almost, um, and uh, you know that's the power of this virus. Um, you know, it's really. It's smashing through any weaknesses we have in our systems. It's exposing them in, in a big way. And that's why I think overall Australia is, I think it's showing how good our systems are. I mean, the reality is you, we do have a very strong welfare system. We have an excellent universal healthcare system. Um, we were already very wealthy beforehand. So we probably have a much stronger um, kind of safety net in terms of savings as well as the welfare so in some ways, I think all our relative strength, and I think our institutional strength, it will also be shown here. I mean, the fact is we have some of the best doctors in the world, some of the best public health officials, and um, I think a lot of our policy makers too, I think, are you know, will be shown to be of um, excellent quality here. So I think uh, compared to other parts of the world, I think, uh, I think our, in terms of when the, you know, when the marks are awarded uh, at least at this stage I think will yeah you know, I think will come up very well there were a lot of uh, Australians uh, at the beginning uh, when the the containment measures uh, were announced and implemented did fear that there was going to be some form of uh, civil uh, unrest or and 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 quite uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, rage we we haven't seen that it's it's certainly what uh there has been a lot of shock uh because we've had uh 29 years of uninterrupted economic growth in australia and for uh, we probably all thought that pandemics were uh were something uh of the past that uh, we'd mastered uh medicine but uh, of course uh viruses like humanity uh, evolve as well and so the the main issue or to how to get through this is is not uh, there's not it, there doesn't seem like there's going to be a breakdown in public order now but uh, certainly people they, they they need to be able to cope and adjust quickly because of this uh, shock we we met, we've just gone through the 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 center link lines and also with the 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 business shutdowns we now have the 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 social distancing isolation measures where uh governments are now telling uh, australians to st stay at home do not leave unless unless it's for work getting essential supplies and and exercise uh you uh, have your your wife and and children so uh you're lucky that uh You've got each other to to help uh, support you, but uh, not everyone is is so fortunate. And it amazed me that uh, twenty five percent of private residents in Australia are single dwellings, which that's that shocked me that there's that much loneliness uh, in Australia, and especially during yeah, this we time. certainly have high rates of single parent places. Now, look, loneliness isn't the same as living alone. There'll be a lot of people who live alone, who would say they're not necessarily lonely um, because they'll still be well-connected, et cetera, but they prefer to live alone. But you are right. I mean, that's one of the hardest parts, even though I've got my immediate, say, wife and, and children, you know, like many others, you know, my parents, we're, we're trying to kind of isolate them and and it's uh, horrible, isn't it? Like you'll have your kid's birthday and they can't mm. see them. We're trying to call them every day and stay in contact however we can. But, I mean, that's a huge challenge. So on one level, um, an interesting thing I've seen with some of my patients, on one level, um, obviously there's a great deal of emotional distress, but at the same time, for a lot of people, they've never had a sense of this sort of shared threat. So even though we're kind of, you know, all kind of stuck in our homes, we probably never felt the same sense of shared threat. So a lot of people who do have psychological disorders, and they've usually, part of the problem has been they experience it alone. So on some level, some of them aren't quite as distressed as you might think because they feel, I guess, more connected to the people around them, even though they may be physically distant. So that's an interesting thing. So some aspects of mental health will not necessarily worsen. Some will. And the aspects that will worsen will partly be due to very practical reasons. 
So in the Western world, you know, sometimes what we, uh, you know, sort of negatively call affluenza or something, there's certainly an element of mental health that has been about this combination of great prosperity and a kind of lack of purpose where, you know, people have had a kind of pointlessness to their lives, but they've been very wealthy, but they're trying to find a wider purpose or meaning. Whereas in some ways that's been pricked quite thoroughly by this, where people now have a much stronger sense of, I need to survive, I need to, you know, provide, etc. It's kind of back to basics, you know, yeah. economy, back to essentials. So you'll find in some people that's, that actually, uh, from, a, from a purely mental health point of view, it can actually improve some people because it just gives them much firmer direction and need. And this has been seen in the world wars and that kind of thing. And not only do people feel a much stronger sense of shared purpose, it can also heighten certain social roles. So back then when you had much more traditional households, for example, the women's role in the house was much, much, was especially valued. They had to manage the house, etc. Obviously, many for men, it can be harder because many of them lose their provider role. Um, uh, so in some ways, it, it can be more challenging on one respects. The caring role can be, uh, I think there will be a lot more men these days that will be engaged more thoroughly in the caring roles, be it with grandparents or children, um, you know, much more so. So it'll, it'll be, you know, there'll be a whole wealth of data that comes from this, you know, showing some of our social changes. But I think there'll be some things that will revert some very traditional models um, as well. I, I think that'll be interesting to see. I mean, so far, look, I'm not seeing, you know, suddenly like a huge spike in, you know, say people getting suicidal or anything like that. I think at the moment people are very much like, right, we need to survive. There's a real strong sense of purpose and trying to band together. Um, there's certainly a, a, an anxiety, but that anxiety is thoroughly realistic, whereas most of the people I'd previously seen with anxiety disorders it was usually a overestimation of risk. You know, as people who you know couldn't go outside without getting panic attacks or something like that. Whereas now, the sense of threat is a is a perfectly legitimate one. Um, you know, it's certainly not a pathological one. You mentioned uh, affluenza, affluenza uh, which is, uh, 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 as you said, that that it's people who are searching for, for meaning and tend to uh, base uh, their success in life by what material uh, uh, possessions or uh, lifestyle they're living. And that's been completely uh, stripped now. We, we did see in the, the early days with the, the, the panic buying uh, quite a bit of uh, selfish behaviour in the supermarkets with those uh, fights that were filmed over... Uh, 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 fights that were filmed about toilet paper in the uh, the supermarkets, and there was quite a lot of uh, national cringe and uh, embarrassment. And then there was that that famous uh, uh, footage and photos of people out at Bondi Beach, uh, not yeah. social distancing. And we have at the moment uh, those who are returning to Australia forced into mandatory isolation in hotels during those videos, uh, complaining. Uh, about the conditions because breakfast was late and apparently it wasn't cooked to uh, their their preferred taste. We're, but we are <laughs> seeing, on the whole, a transition from an individualistic, materialistic culture to, to one of community and national and, and civic uh, duty. As you said, the uh, our... our basic survival instincts have, have kicked in and we also need to be more of a community and our, our leaders have said and even though they they are trying to pol uh, police these they 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 are relying on people to to do the the right thing and there is also a lot of uh social as as it's as it's called, um, social pressure on people to practice proper social distancing and do the right thing by each other. Yeah, look, absolutely. Look, I think Australians are pretty compliant people, to be honest. I mean, we're not as... Uh, I don't think we're terribly individualistic, actually. I think we're quite pragmatic. And realistically, I mean, we love regulations and all this stuff. I mean, we put up with all manner of stuff. So we are, I think, quite a compliant, authority-loving people, despite being you know, probably amongst the most in... Well, I think we're closer to, say, Britain in terms of following rules and all that kind of stuff than we are to the Americans as such. So uh, we're a pragmatic people. We're not an ideological people, I don't think. So 
I think people are quite quick to shift to what's necessary. And even though we, yeah, we complain about, you know, hating our politicians, not trusting them, but I think, again, part of that, I still think of so much of what's happened in recent decades were luxuries. So, so many of our de debates and, you know, our angst were, was really a function of how prosperous we were um, and we could sort of get away with it. But I think when, when in things, you know, when you batten down the hatches and things get real, as they very much have, um, I think our politicians, for the most part, you know, come come to the party. And I think then we, I mean, partly we've got no choice to trust them to some extent, but I think we do trust them then. I think, you know, we don't think there's some other, um, there's obviously some very difficult trade-offs, but I think for I think when it really matters, we, we trust our key authorities, you know, be it mm. our government, our, um, uh, the, the, in this case, a lot of the doctors and the sci top scientists, um, I mean, the, may, we may be a bit more sceptical of the media, but I think overall uh, our institutions are much more solid than we've probably given them credit for. It's interesting seeing somebody like uh, Mike Carlton. I'm not sure if you've ever encountered him uh, in person or, or online, but he's always been quite vitriolic on, on Twitter. But he's come to the realisation that this is a, a warlike situation. And, of course, he says, I don't like the Liberals, don't like Scott Morrison, but he's our war leader. Uh, we, we basically need to stop all this bickering, this Scotty from marketing stuff to basically help see our nation through it and of course we've had as you're alluding to toxic politics for the last uh 10 years we are st still seeing so, uh, a lot of sniping online but sort of those those petty political squabbles i mean who thought that christian porter and sally mcmanus would become basically yeah, their so it's, it's, it's a very interesting bedfellows in recent weeks don't they so you know they've come together i mean this is where yeah again very practical a lot of old ideologies it would be interesting what happens you know, on the other side of this. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I know some of the things, say, your site has railed against, and rightly so, you know, some of, be it from, you know, tr um, safe spaces on universities to to veganism to to the uh, to the worst parts of, say, animal rights and uh, some of the extinction rebellion. So some of, the, some of the worst aspects of the left, and look, there's, you know, this happens on the right too, um, but to, to a different extent. You know, a lot of that has been pricked. They've been shown for the for the non problems they were, and I, I can't say who was writing it, but I know one analogy I was reading was that a lot of political activists, you could imagine political, you know, with the infection analogy, the political activists were the are the white blood cells of society, and when they had nothing real to come after, they turn on themselves. They turn on society itself. And I think there it was an element of that in the past couple of decades where it was all these kind of non-problems, kind of manufactured problems that were actually hurting our society and discourse. And a lot of that, you know, I mean, that's probably one of the things I secretly uh, am enjoying about uh, recent events where it's just pricked so much, you know, so much of the, uh, what's the word, you know, essentially the bollocks really, some... Uh, so much of the the yeah extinction the rebellion oh. and Greta Inc they're out of business uh, overnight. In fact, uh, our uh, our premier in Victoria, General Andrews, uh, during the first week of the pandemic, uh, announced that he was lifting the uh, the moratorium on onshore uh, gas exploration, despite him having uh, that renewable it's all energy uh, show, target. Shows that people do not actually hold these views with great. With great conviction, when when uh, you know when other things are at risk, uh, you know more real things are at risk. So it shows that so much, so much of these belief systems were about virtue signaling. It was more about uh, it was more about communicating identity and status within certain social groups, and you know that comes tumbling down very quickly when there's more you know more serious matters at hand and genuine threats, and even a lot of the same people who held those views. You know, now they're scrambling to survive economically and, uh, you know, suddenly the, the room for them to sprout those views is, is much more limited. And uh, as I said previously, we are seeing more of a nationalistic spirit uh, during this uh, pandemic and it's not being viewed as a bad thing as uh, a lot of people thought 
in the in the past. But after this uh, pandemic is over, because on the the current uh, projections and trends. Uh, Western Europe, the, the United States, are going to be completely decimated in in terms of both the the deaths and the the economic damage. And uh, because it looks like we are going to come out of this uh, well and and better than there's still going to be a recovery phase, but it's going to be Australia alone. We can't rely on those those allies that we once had to sort of trade in that and we're certainly not not going to trust china uh like we we have in the past or uh basically being compliant with them as uh, uh, a lot of our uh politicians and and businesses were um look um we don't know yet so that would be the hope now certainly the hope is that uh, we do get through this better than others, and there is the chance. And I think you are right. There'll be there'll be a lot of changes to this. I mean, one, there'll be much more focus on self-sufficiency, especially in matters of national security. So but there'll be a sense that we need to have a manufacturing base, that we, you know, that we need to have some key thing, medicines, etc. We need to have some key things. So I think there will be rever reversion to sorts, a bit more of an internal reversion. So in some ways we are all reverting, be it to family and nation. We're kind of, you know, reaching inwards a bit. And some, of, I think most of that is quite positive. And, but we do still need global institutions. I, I remember something I was just reading this morning, I think it was a Swedish, former Swedish prime minister tweeted, you know, suddenly the G20, the United Nations, they all look pretty weak. Mm. And, one of the few, and the US looks very weak as a global power here. Um, and the only global force, you know, is COVID. You know, that's really, that's the only superpower at the moment. Well, World Health Organization, their credibility and well, the trust true. in them they, has been decimated they, as well. They, they don't, they've lost a lot of credibility over this. And, and that, this is another area where Australia was ahead of the curve. You know, we banned flights from China against World Health Organization um, recommendations. And, and, you know, that was a very good decision. Uh, so this is where, again, our institutions and authorities have acted very well on, on many on many of the questions through this crisis. Um, so, look, a hell of a lot's going to change. You know, this is a world historical event, um, uh, Tim, you know, where we're all going to come out the other side uh, slightly changed. Some things will reemerge, but, you know, they, these are transformative and we're all going to adapt. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that's what we're going to focus on. But I think Australia will... Certainly at this stage, the way it's looking, we have the potential to come out much stronger than the many countries in the Western world. Well, our leaders are sticking to that uh, six-month time frame where these containment measures have, have got to be uh, in place. And uh, we are slowly getting used to it despite the, uh, the shock. And obviously, uh, I mentioned the, the, the stay-at-home uh, advice the the four reasons uh, that you're only allowed to to leave the the house one of them is uh, uh, exercising because well, it has been an expression like I need to get out of the house to basically clear my head get some get some fresh air that's a legitimate uh, form because there, there are health effects to being uh, cooped up and of course some people are, as you said coping better than others some people already kept to themselves and uh, stayed at home most of the time didn't go out others their whole lives was social events and going to gigs and sporting events and obviously they've been affected as well our arts and and sports uh, live entertainment uh, that's all been shut down yeah look absolutely yeah I mean um yeah, I'm sorry, I missed the actual question there, Tim. Oh, so, so I, was, uh, I, I was saying that uh, the, 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 the way that we've been in terms of the social gatherings, I'll, I'll rephrase it, the, uh, with attendance at arts, sports, live entertainment, uh, events, basically that's how the, the lifestyle was, was going out, not on the town, seeing the, the city, that's obviously... It, we've been told six months, but obviously there's going to be still massive changes in how we consume those things and how those businesses survive. Look, yeah, a lot of that's going to change, isn't it? You're right. I mean, I can, some of the things won't go back. Uh, and a lot of that will be better. I mean, there's some, I mean, even in my industry and uh, certainly the law and so a lot of areas where they've been just very slow to embrace that digital side when, 
uh, they're forced to do it now. And I've been dealing with some lawyers when I do criminal work, and men, so, you know, many of them have, uh, have said, you know, look, some we should have been doing this years ago. We just haven't had to. Um, so many of the things, epidemics historically, uh, and something. Uh, I mean, I my next column in the Financial Review is about this. Is that epidemics speed up history? So a host of other trends. So when you look at past trends, the, for example, in the Spanish flu, uh, lot, trends like um, the apartheid, for example, it changed the way um, blacks and whites were interacting. And even though there were ideas around apartheid, it actually got sped up by the Spanish flu. Likewise, the bubonic plague, the certainly view that that was a key factor in the Industrial Revolution, because it made labour much more expensive because there was a, a much less supply of it. And this was much more pronounced in Northern Europe and particularly places like the United Kingdom. And that was a key driver because capital was so expensive in compared to labour. There was a much stronger incentives for um, the, the developments that led to the Industrial Revolution. So we're seeing that too now, especially, say, digital. You look at companies like Amazon, et cetera, who are really profiting from this uh, digital bank. So... The shift to digital will be heightened, but I also think there was also a wider protest here in recent years, say Brexit, Trump. Part of that was a half century of social and economic liberalism, which placed individualism, individual autonomy, individual desire, all of these kind of things at, at the top, uh, at the expense of, say, family, community, tradition, uh, country, all of these kind of things. And Brexit, Trump, to some extent, were, were a protest against that. And coronavirus is accelerating those trends. It's accelerated those trends, you know, in, 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 a, in a very big way. So suddenly we're all anti-globalists and yeah. we're feeding into family, community, tradition uh, in, in, in an extraordinary way. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I've uh, concluded as well. Uh, as uh, we've both said, uh, it looks like Australia will come out of this uh, better in terms of uh, containing it and having less deaths and having a faster economic recovery, but we always put an asterisk against our uh, predictions uh, during this pandemic because it's a virus, it's not a human being, we don't know how it's going to react. But I've appreciated you uh, coming on, uh, Tanvir, to, to share your, your expertise and uh, uh, analysis and uh, all the best uh, with uh, or your continued practice and obviously I will keep looking out for you in the uh, financial review when on uh, Sky News uh, in my view and and other appearances. Excellent. Good luck to you, Tim, and stay safe. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.